Communities aren't static over time. They change, and this process is called succession. Every community is in a state of flux. Individuals come into the community, they die, they're replaced by others of their species or perhaps another species, and the non-living parts of the community move as well, nutrients and energy. Certain communities stay relatively stable for long periods of time, showing no cumulative directional change. These are what we refer to as climax communities that are in equilibrium with the environment. Other communities are transient. They're only there for a certain amount of time, changing on their way to something else. These are called successional communities or serial communities. And the different stages of succession are sometimes referred to as seers. So we can define succession as a directional cumulative change in species which occupy a given area through time. But the climax, which seems to not change, is actually a dynamic equilibrium. And we'll say more about that later. There are two main kinds of succession, primary and secondary. Primary is that succession that occurs on new land, land not previously vegetated, like volcanic islands that arise made from lava, sand dunes from piles of sand on the edge of oceans and lakes, and land left behind as glaciers recede, bare land, no vegetation. Then there's secondary succession on land previously vegetated but somehow disturbed or the vegetation destroyed. And there are lots of examples of that. After agriculture, is, the fields are abandoned after a fire or after a major disturbance like a hurricane. Let's look at some photos, these from a textbook. Dune succession. In A, the sand piling up through the action of the waves and the wind, and first held in place by rhizomatous grasses that grow over the bare sand. You can see that in B. And once that area is stabilized, other plants can grow in C, shorter at first, until D, you get a forest at the, uh, in back of the dune. That was primary succession, but here's an example of secondary succession. Old black and white pictures of an ad abandoned farm field in A, first being colonized by short, weedy annuals and perennials that change the substrate enough that larger things, bushes and shrubs, come in, then fast-growing softwood trees, and eventually turning into a hardwood forest, the climax community. Again, succession is directional cumulative change in species that occupy a given area over time. When that community reaches a stable point, people used to think that all change stopped when the climax was reached. But really, that is equilibrium is dynamic not really unchanging because species are changing in abundance even though they're all present and individuals are dying. Sometimes going back to a slightly earlier serial stage here and there in the forest and coming back to the climax community. Another way of distinguishing primary and secondary succession is the presence of soil. Primary starts with bare rock, no soil to begin with. In secondary succession, the soil that's developed previously is retained, and also plant propagules, seeds and um, storage roots, etc. There are many cool examples of primary succession. We'll look at a few, but here's a list. When glaciers retreat, the bare rocky ground they leave roads that are made by humans and then abandoned, the asphalt cracks, plants start to grow. In the tundra, 
gravel pads were made where oil drilling has taken place and when they are left plants colonize them strip mines lay the substrate rocky substrate bare sea cliffs um, pieces fall off into the sea leaving bare exposed rock landslides also leave rock sometimes different landslides may have soil as well volcanic islands we mentioned before and lava fields in places where there are active volcanoes that bear uh, the hot molten lava kills everything and then after a while things grow on that and even water can be colonized by vegetation in a process called bog succession this is one of the coolest phenomena and very common in my home state of Michigan where there are many, many, many lakes throughout the peninsula, the lower peninsula and upper peninsula. And these little freshwater lakes, over time, a mat of mosses, sphagnum moss especially, grows out over the edge of the lake. And as it dies, it fills in the edge. And after a while, other vegetation can grow on top of it. And after time, shrubs and trees come in till you're left with just a trickle of the river or stream in the bottom in sea in this picture or sometimes um, disappear completely after a while. This dramatic picture is a lava field and that white piece of wood like driftwood is a dead tree. So a boiling lava field sterilizes the place for quite a while, but after a while, spores of small plants that don't need much, mosses and maybe some ferns, start to grow with a little bit of moisture, and their presence alters the terrain so that other plants' seeds can establish. In 1980, a long time ago now, but this is during the time I was in graduate school in Northern California at UC Berkeley, and up the west coast of the U.S., Mount St. Helens erupted in Washington State. And a professor at the University of Washington, Roger Del Moral, monitored succession at various locations, some places that got severe damage, and experienced primary succession and others that had secondary succession. So on the internet, on the web, you can see his photo documentation, and I'll show you a few pictures. One is of Studebaker Ridge, one series of photos where there was an intense blast, lots of lava, and the other Pine Creek, which got mildly scoured. So here's Studebaker Ridge, where primary succession took place. The blast was in 1980, and you can see in the upper left-hand picture, there's nothing but bare rock and rubble there. 1986, two years later, I don't see any green there. 1992, maybe a little bit of greenery starting to show up here and there, where moss spores have taken hold and then 1997 almost 20 years later you can see shrubby plants starting to grow. Here's Pine Creek with a mild scour experienced and you can see even one year later there are some stems of plants oops I'm trying to outline this and it's not working Anyway, little bit of vegetation obvious in the ravine. Finally, I got the pen tip working. So here in 1982, one year later, the very same spots, the plants are getting bigger. Four years later, in 1984, some sizable shrubs. And 1985, 
Certainly the whole surface isn't green, but you can see in a matter of 10 or 15 years, things may be getting pretty much back to normal. So why is primary succession so much slower than secondary succession? It's because without soil, the substrate can't hold water very well, and nor can it hold nutrients. There are no bacteria or fungi that live there to facilitate the establishment of other of plants. And so the first colonizers are plants that are called poikilohydric plants, those that get their water externally, such as lichens, mosses, and some ferns. They are able to reap some small amounts of nutrients from the atmosphere, but the, often the ones to get established first can fix their own nitrogen. In primary succession, usually this first stage takes a long time, sometimes 50 years or more, until some little pockets of soil develop, and then you can see species of other plants, seed plants, flowering plants, germinating in the clumps of moss where the initial colonists have started, there's a little bit of soil that's formed there. So the action of waves can cause disturbance on land previously vegetated, but then it can be primary succession if new substrate is laid down. Here's the south end of Hog Island in coastal Virginia. This is a long-term ecological research site. And let's go to Michigan again, my favorite state on the northwest edge of the Lower Peninsula is the Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore. In the center you can see where I'm talking about on the map of Michigan. <clears throat> and these dunes are very huge, about 200 feet high. And sand is constantly pushed up and there's dune succession along the edge of the sand at the top of the dunes. And you can see that the dunes are on the peninsula, the, the Leelanau Peninsula, but there's two islands, Manitou and South Manitou Islands, that you take a ferry to, and they also have beautiful dunes on them. Anywhere where there's wave action, the shorelines can shift, and places along the shore often have lighthouses, like here's Nauset Light on Cape Cod, it had to be moved because the land under it was washed away. And these sorts of habitats have some rare plants too, pitchers, thistles, and endangered species in these northeastern coastal areas. Sometimes people try to hold back the dunes or keep them from moving, putting up fences. That doesn't always work, but it does help keep people from running over them and interfering with the natural um, succession of vegetation to hold the sand down. Here's a picture on the west coast, the other coast, I guess looking south at Point Reyes National Seashore. And even in, in the middle of a continent, here you can have primary succession on dunes such as these sandy areas in Death Valley. There's lots of examples of secondary succession. When forests are cleared for logging and then left, things can start to grow again. In the New World tropics, slash and burn agriculture was common and fields left after that, after crops were grown for a few years, are recolonized. Field abandonment in any part of the world can experience secondary succession. And many habitats are successional due to fire and flooding and sometimes dieback caused by insects or disease or other pest outbreaks. I'm going to show you some beautiful portraits from an exhibit at the Harvard Forest from dioramas. These are displays in a museum. This is an example of old field succession, secondary succession in New England forests. 
Here we see what the forest looked like pre-settlement, before the Europeans came over. The Native Americans lived here, but without disturbing the natural environment very much. The settlers came and cleared homesteads, and you can see the rocky soil. They tilled it and took the rocks and built rock walls. So in this soil area, crops could be grown. A hundred years or so later, the Industrial Revolution and other things happened, and farming wasn't as popular as it once was, so the farm was abandoned. The field is fallow. After small plants paved the way, softwood trees, fast-growing pines, filled up these abandoned fields. And then those are taken over by hardwoods, which grow taller and crowd out, shade out the pines. Here's a forest growing, filling with hardwoods. We can see the landscape painter in the foreground. Until today, the modern forest landscape looks very much like the original forest, but there's some differences. Maybe you can see something that shows that this forest has undergone succession. And to give you a little hint, I'll circle some. Where did those rocks come from to build that wall?